You may have realized that being healthy feels different than it did in the past now that you're over 50. If you want to maximize your health potential but don't have time to read through overwhelming pages of Google links, this is the show for you. Welcome to Healthy Tips After 50. We love doing the research, finding solutions, talking to health experts, and learning what works and what doesn't. Now, your host. She spent the last 25 years dedicated to feeling her best and is here to share her best findings with you, Susan Rosen. Hi, this is your host, Susan Rosen. And today I'm going to talk about a relatively new book that came out in March of, of this year called The Longevity Paradox. It's by Dr. Stephen Gundry. You may have heard of him because he's written a number of earlier books, including The Plant Paradox, which came out a couple of years ago. That one also got a lot of press and a lot of attention. This book is about what influences our longevity and how we can live longer. I'm sure that all of us are interested in that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read you some parts of the book that will give you an idea of what is in the book and how easily readable it is. This is one book that I have found it very hard to put down. Every time I start looking at it to look at some particular portion of it, and I thought, oh, I would just skim it to figure out what to go back to read. And what ends up happening is that I start to look at a chapter and then I find myself reading it, underlining parts, putting post-it flags on it to mark particularly important things. My point is that his way of writing is clear, informative, and most importantly, easy to read and understanding and understand. And in many cases, it's actually entertaining, um, which I don't usually use talking about a book on health. But it makes it so that you don't mind reading it. And actually, I personally, I get a little obsessive about it. So this is why I'm going to read you a little bit from his introduction, which will give you a feeling for what he's trying to accomplish with his book and also how well he writes. Then I'm going to read you a little bit from his first chapter and talk about why it's important. And after that, I'll tell you about the different chapters in the book and what's covered in each of them. I may also mention a few of the most interesting things in a chapter. And it could very well be that I read you a little bit more of it. Like I said, I do love this book. What I'm trying to do, as I said, is to give you a feel for what's in the book. And then you can decide if you want to buy it for yourself or do you want to wait for me to give you more highlights in the blog post or maybe even another podcast. There is so much information in here. By the way, there will be a link in the show notes to the book on Amazon. So if you do want to buy it, you can do it easily. If you don't see it in the show notes for wherever it is that you listen to the podcast, then be sure to go over to my website because it will definitely be there. Either way, there's a lot of valuable information in this book and he isn't preachy about any of it. So it doesn't make you feel guilty if you can't or won't follow his plan in total or his recommendations. Okay, so let's jump in. And like I said, I'm going to start by reading you part of his introduction. And he starts with saying, as I was writing this book, Edith Morey, whom I, whom I identified in all of my previous books as Michelle, passed quickly, in other words, she passed away, and peacefully onward, just two weeks shy of her 106th birthday. I first met Edith shortly after I moved from my practice from Loma Linda University to Palm Springs, California. When she walked into my examination room, I encountered a thin, tall, erect, beautiful woman with a gorgeous head of hair who was dressed to the nines. To my eyes, she appeared to be about 65 years old. But a quick glance at the chart started my hand shaking. Forget 65 or 75 or even 85. She was in her 90s. The woman standing before me in three-inch heels, I kid you not, appeared shockingly young, 
yet her chart revealed that she was, in fact, quite old. In Loma Linda, California, one of the world's best-known blue zones, I had encountered many healthy centenarians. Nevertheless, I was singularly unprepared to meet Edith. She exemplified a seeming paradox. Chronological old age wrapped up in an implausibly youthful, vital, physical form. Edith told me she had attended one of my recent speaking engagements and that I reminded her of someone else she'd heard speak about nutrition more than 70 years ago when she was just 20 years old. That person was the nutritionist, Gaylord Hauser, whose advice she'd been following to the letter ever since. She'd bought and read each of his books, adopted his dietary protocol, and stuck to her guns even when her husbands, she buried two in her time, including one who was a doctor, had told her she was crazy. After a lifetime of following Hauser's advice, she was still fit as a fiddle. I couldn't believe my good fortune in meeting her. I peppered her with questions, wanting to know more about what exactly she'd learned from Hauser and how she'd maintained her health and vitality for so many years. Though I became her doctor and remained so until the day she passed, I can say for certain that I learned more from her than she learned from me. She showed me that the longevity paradox I'd imagined, the ability to die young at a ripe old age, was indeed a possibility that was available to all. Well, I agree. I think that that is how we all should live. We should be here and be healthy until the very last day. And at that day, we should just go and just be out of here. I'm going to also tell you about one of the things that he talks about in here. And also in the introduction, he starts talking about the bacteria and the mitochondria that are in our bodies and that actually make up most of what controls our body and our lives. It's very interesting because he's talking about how the mitochondria and the bacteria thousands or hundreds and thousands of years ago says that he said, would it be too, I'm quoting again, would it be too, quote, out there, unquote, to suggest that bacteria actually created animals, including humans, so they could avoid oxygen and live safely on Earth? And talk about out there. Suppose I told you that the bacteria in your gut keep in close contact with their relatives, the mitochondria inside your cells, in order to communicate with them about how things are going on the other side. We'll discuss all of this and more in the pages to follow. So he talks a little bit more about all of that, and he gives you some history about it. What he says, though, at, some, at one point is, so your longevity is paradoxically tied to the fate of these ancient organisms. The oldest parts of you have the power to help you keep young. It all goes back to the bacteria's need to survive and pass on their DNA. Your body is essentially a condominium for your microbiome, or as I like to say, as I like to call them, your bugs. You are their home, and as you'll soon learn, if you provide a nice hospitable home for them, they will be exceptionally good tenants. They'll keep the utilities running efficiently, the plumbing in tip-top shape, and even the exterior paint fresh. On the other hand, if you feed them foods they do not thrive on, allow squatters to move in and take over and let the foundation rot, they'll give up and let the rest of you decay right along with it. Our relationship with our bugs has always been and continues to be symbiotic. In other words, their health is dependent on you and vice versa. You take care of them and they'll take care of you for the long term. So what he, it's really kind of actually kind of cute. He calls all of those, those good bugs, his gut buddies. And he, through the whole book, 
he'll keep saying, okay, this is something that your gut buddies really like. And otherwise, he talks about the bad bacteria as well and how to try and get rid of and not feed the bad bacteria. In fact, in one place he says, but here's the good news. If you starve out the bad guys and throw the good guys a lifeline, the good guys will reemerge, reinforce the border, and revitalize the neighborhood. What's more, those good bacteria will start asking you for more of what they need to succeed. I just love the way that he uses the whole picture of our bodies and our minds to a large degree and our thoughts being the condominium or the home for the good bacteria and actually for the bad bacteria as well. But as with any home, you want to keep out the bad stuff and only keep the good stuff so that the roof doesn't leak and that your foundation doesn't start to crack. So he talks about all of these different things. It turns out he was actually a heart surgeon. Um, I know that he has stopped actually doing heart surgery because he felt that it was much more important to start getting this information out into the world, into the public, to try and help people to have longer lives and to live healthier and better until the very end. He also talks about that what he is trying to do here is to go through and explain all of this to us and tell us why his particular ideas and based on experience and also on, um, I was going to say history, but that's probably not the right word, of what has come before us and the things that people have learned about our mitochondria and our bacteria, which has brought us to the place where we are and has influenced this book and the meal plan along with all of the foods that he talks about that will help us to get our bodies into better shape so that we can survive for a longer time and enjoy life and not have to be spending a lot of time battling sickness. So in his, we talk a little bit about his chapters and the way that he's organized the book. The first section is called the aging myths. And there's three chapters in there. One of them is ancient genes control your fate. And in there, he talks even more so about the mitochondria and the bacteria and how we've ended up with many more of those than genes, that we actually don't have as many genes and human genes as, say, some of the different other bacteria and other animals, or even some crops like corn has 10,000 or more genes than we have. We only have, I think it's 20,000 or 21,000, and corn has 31,000 genes. And that's because we have all of this other bacteria and mitochondria that is running our bodies, and so therefore we don't need the genes. One other thing that he talks about is that, especially once you get out of your parents' house, you probably are going to have more in common in your body with the people that you're living with than with your parents and your own ancestors because the genes have so little power over how your body progresses and becomes either healthy or not healthy. So it's interesting in the the chapter one, which is ancient genes control your fate, he says in there that, um, let's see, where is it? Individuals in the analysis published in Nature 
The makeup of an individual's gut bacteria was a better predictor of many health outcomes, including blood glucose level and obesity than genetics. In other words, you have a better chance of sharing the same health conditions as your roommate or your spouse than your biological parents. And that's not because of luck or coincidence. It's because you have similar gut bugs. So that's what I was saying earlier. So there's a number of research reports that he talks about, which is very interesting. And he also says that when researchers take feces from obese rats and feed them to skinny rats, presto changeo, the skinny rats become fat. The reverse is also true. Eating a skinny rat's poop makes fat rats thin. In a need a human example, in the 1930s, psychiatric patients suffering from severe depression were giving laxatives to clean out their colons and then given enemas with fecal matter from people who were not depressed. The result, the patients had a marked improvement in mood. So I know from listening and reading about some other kinds of reports and research projects that they are also doing that now a lot, or I should say in a lot of different places with a lot of clinics where they are taking the fecal matter from one person who has a very healthy microbiome and they are giving it and putting it into the microbiome, the colon and and intestines of someone who has a lot of issues, maybe IBS or some other kind of um, gut problems. And they are finding that by doing that, they can improve that person's microbiome, that though the, the fecal matter that they're putting in there has all of the probiotics and a lot of the other bacteria and mitochondria that then goes in and fills in and repopulates the host, the new host person's um, colon. So all of this is, is really something that obviously they've known and been doing for many, many, actually for decades. And it's all now coming full circle because we're getting a much better and stronger medical practice and area of people in functional medicine where they're more open to doing some of these things that are not as invasive as some of the pharmaceuticals and the um, x-rays and the chemical treatments that they have for people for particular diseases. Okay, so he talks about his, your, our gut buddies at work. Um, and he talks about the sisterhood of bacteria. It's really kind of interesting. We'll go back to the table of contents. So he's talking about chapter two is called protect and defend. Chapter three is called what you think is keeping you young is probably making you old. And that actually is kind of, is also very interesting because that's where he talks about the seven deadly myths of aging. And it's really amazing because number one is the myth. Number one is the Mediterranean diet promotes longevity. What's interesting about that is that he actually took another look at the blue zones. And there are quite a few of them around the Mediterranean, which is how the whole idea of the Mediterranean diet started. Well, it comes to be that when you look at all of the blue zones and you look at what they have in common, what they have in common is, is, is that they are not eating large amounts of animal protein. In fact, some of them don't eat any at all. And he points out that that actually is the important part and the important item that goes across all of them. Because if you look at the people from Loma Linda, then you see that 
they are using a lot of soybeans and nuts in the form of textured vegetable protein and that they also found that the people there who ate some, med some animal protein or even more animal protein actually do not live as long as those that are not eating any animal protein. And this is a whole different take on the whole idea of the blue zones and then also having to do with the Mediterranean diet, which I also have another podcast on. So it might be time to go back and look at that again. Myth two is that animal protein is essential for strength and longevity. Myth three is growth hormones promote youthfulness and vitality. No. Myth four is a high metabolic rate is a sign of good health. So it turns out that stimulating IGF-1 is the main reason consuming animal protein ages you so rapidly is that it requires a lot of energy to metabolize. And if you consume large quantities of meat on a regular basis, your metabolism never gets a chance to slow down. This is why true carnivores spend much of their day sleeping to conserve their energy and slow their high metabolic rates. So when he talks about carnivores, he's talking about animals, not people, obviously. Okay, myth five is it's important to get plenty of iron as you age. And myth six is that saturated fat should not be demonized, which again is very interesting. And myth seven is that milk does a body good. The second section is about, is called talking about my regeneration. And in it, he talks about getting younger from the inside out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, chapter five is dance your way into old age. Chapter six is remember your old age, which has to do with brain function. Chapter seven is look younger as you age. And a lot of that has to do with what you eat. And he goes into all of that. The longevity paradox program is section three. And that's where he actually gets into the paradox, the longevity paradox foods, the meal plan, the lifestyle plan. And then also chapter 11 is a list of paradox supplements, which is really interesting as well, because at one point he lists all of the supplements that he takes. And someone that I was reading a review of the book actually counted them all and said that he takes, according to his list, 77 supplements. So that totally puts me to shame because I don't take anywhere near that, but I take a hell of a lot of them. So that was very impressive. So overall, like I said, there is so much information in this book that I can't even tell you about it. That's why I'm not even going to go there with it. He talks about so many different foods, different things to eat, different things not to eat. Talks about green tea and how good that is for you. Talks about the things that destroy your gut and that your bad, bad bugs love. He calls them bad bug favorites, like simple sugars and starches and the different fruits, conventional dairy products. He also talks a lot about fats, saturated fats in particular. And to him, it's even at a lower level. He talks about saturated fats that are from plant food, like avocado, which he loves and thinks is very good for you, and saturated fats that come from animal fats, which again, since he doesn't feel that anything that we eat from an animal and the animal proteins has anything good for us. He also feels the same way about the saturated fats that come from animals. So if you're interested, I would get the book. Like I said, this thing has so much incredible information. I have been just reading it and reading parts of it over and over again and trying to figure out how to apply it in my life. 
And he's also very clear that if you can't do all of it, that's all right. That you don't have to do this. It's not a black or white. If you can, that's great. But if you can't, for whatever reason, that's okay too. Try and do the things that are most important. Try and keep up that condominium for all of your good bugs and your gut buddies. That's what he's trying to get across to everybody. So that's it for me for today. I want to remind you that I'm not a doctor and this is not to be construed as medical advice. The guy who wrote this book is a medical doctor, so you might want to take his that way, but not what I say. Be sure and watch for my blog posts and my podcasts. You can follow me on Facebook. I have a page there, Healthy Tips After 50. You can go to my website at healthytipsafter50.com or you can listen to my podcast on Apple, Stitcher, Google Play, different places around. And I would always welcome any comments that you have and that you want to make on any of these different platforms. I try and look at them all. The ones that are the easiest for me to answer are the ones that are on my website. But otherwise, if you go to my website, there is a free ebook that you can get which will add you to my email list. And at that point, you will get updates about whenever I post podcasts or blog posts or anything else that's going on. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you will get a lot out of it. And also that you might be interested in actually going and purchasing the book. I think it would be a great investment for you. I will look forward to talking to you next time. And that's it for me. This has been Healthy Tips After 50 with Susan Rosen. To stay on the cutting edge of the most effective health strategies, subscribe to this podcast and let us know what you thought of the show with a comment or like on iTunes. Visit HealthyTipsAfter50.com for this episode's show notes, more resources, and free offers.